Okay. Good to see you. This is beautiful. We're joined now by the head coach of the North Carolina Tar Heels, Roy Williams. We'll ask Coach Williams to tip things off with an opening statement. Then he'll take some questions. Uh, static to be here. We've already practiced an hour and a half out on the court. Uh, um, thought we had a good practice. Need to have a good film session later today, or tape session, I guess is what they call it now. Um, and then we need to have a good practice tomorrow, but I think our kids are enjoying themselves. Uh, uh, people at the hotel have been fantastic. The people here at the arena have been fantastic, and uh, the media guys are always fantastic. So I'm ready. We're looking for the first question for Coach Williams, and we have one, maybe two, just to the right of the aisle. Luke DeCock, Raleigh News and Observer. Roy Marcus has, over his four years, gained an appreciation for analytics and synergy and that kind of side of the game. Does he ever come to you with things that he spots, and when did you become aware that that is something that he was had become interested in? I've seen some of his comments, and he's told me a couple of things, uh, but uh, I like a little dose of it. Uh, you know, I really do, but I don't like a lot of it because it just gives you so much that um, – I think you get so deeply involved in it, you forget about personalities, you forget about the stage of the game when things happen. So uh, I know Marcus is very analytical. Uh, I'm more than I ever was, but still there'd be a huge majority of the people in the basketball world between me and Marcus, much less some of those other guys that are way out there. Uh, but I, I, I'm always willing to take information and think about it and then make decisions whether I think it's valid for our team. Coach, we're going to go all the way to the back of the room for Reed. Yep. Hey, Coach. Uh, Reed Forgrave with uh, FoxSports.com. Uh, you're trying to become just the sixth coach of all time to win th his third national championship, uh, and you're really close, and yet you've had this NCAA investigation looming over the season. I'm curious how you've been able to balance the up-and-down emotions, kind of like the complex emotions of this season? Well, it really hasn't affected uh, the, the, the coaching part because it's been my sort of salvation you know, I go over there and I don't think about all that stuff. And, uh, uh, you know, we have talked about it so much. It's been such a big story that I'm tired of it. Uh, uh, we have the, in my opinion, the greatest sporting event there is, the Final Four going on. And it's about four schools, four teams, four coaching staffs who've worked their tail off to get here. And all that other stuff that sometimes I call junk uh, is uh, been talked about too much. I really want to focus on uh, – uh, my team and the other guys of their teams and what's happening because it's okay to be a, a college basketball player and it's a great, great event to be in the Final Four. And the first part of the question about being the sixth guy, I, people, I really don't think about those things. I'm trying to figure out how in the Dickens I can get enough baskets against Syracuse's zone. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have great kids who have made me look really good and I hope they keep doing it for a long time. Next one will be to the right of the room, to the right of the aisle. Hey, Roy, Mark Armstrong with ABC 11. Um, obviously, the, the trajectory as players has been uh, remarkable for Marcus and Bryce. What do you remember about them personality-wise as freshmen? They really came in as lambs, and they're obviously leaving as much different people. Well, Mark, their personalities were so different and still are so different, but yet you've heard me call them the odd couple because they do really – deep down really enjoy and like each other and it's been a great uh, partnership for them but uh, you know Marcus I knew that after Kendall left because no one thought that, that Kendall would have that kind of opportunity that he did and Marcus as he said several times he thought he was he was coming in to be a backup for Kendall and perhaps play with him a little bit and get indoctrinated into big time college basketball so I felt Marcus a little bit more his whole mental stage because I handed him the ball and said, all right, you got to make us go. And he accepted that. And he didn't, he struggled a little bit, but for the most part, he just handled it and tried to do the best he could do and relish the good plays and put the bad plays behind him and tried to learn from it. Bryce was a guy that I thought had a tremendous upside, but we needed to get his motor going so much more. And Marcus had such a serious side about him and Bryce had such a non-serious side about him. Uh, that you didn't think it was going to work, and it's worked perfectly. But uh, they have grown so much. It's, it's one of the truly great things that I, as a coach, enjoy that sounds corny and everything, but watching those kids uh, uh, mature and grow and develop over the four years has been, um, 
it's been a really neat, neat deal to see those two guys. And I told you guys before, my high school coach told me, he said he thought that uh, uh, coached uh, uh, Bryce and got him to g progress farther and more than anybody that I've ever coached. And my statement back was that gives coaching too much credit. But I do believe that Bryce is right up there. If not the top uh, youngster of improved so much, uh, it may be more than anybody I've ever coached. On the right side toward the back, Mike. Mike Waters, Syracuse Media Group. Roy, uh, you took several teams to a Final Four before you finally got that first national title. Jim Beheim was in the same boat. Uh, Dean, too. What's it mean for a coach when you finally get that first title? And, and does coming to a Final Four, you know, having won one, make the Final Four a different experience for you? Well, the last part is the answer is no. I mean, it, we've won two of them, and I've still just been like a little puppy dog. I mean, I think it's fantastic. and love that part of it. it it means you've accomplished something and it means there's a greater prize out there and now there's only four people that can possibly get that greater prize so that part of it's easy uh, you know for me I, I, I was coach Smith's assistant when I heard all the stuff about he quote can't win the big one which was you know I got a lot of adjectives in the way I described that but uh, I didn't believe in it at the time and I was on his staff when he won uh, when North Carolina won it in 82 when coach was our head coach we made several trips and never won it. Uh, I was part of Jimmy's first one. I'll never forget walking down to shake hands with Jimmy after they beat us in 2003 in New Orleans. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I said, Jimmy, I'm really sad, but I'm really happy for you. And I meant that. And I'll never forget Jimmy's response. He said, basically, thank you. He said, but you're going to get one too. And uh, you know what it is as coaches, you just work. I, I try to work my tail off every day and try to do the best I can do and hopefully at the end of the season look back and evaluate and say, well, we did okay. And I'm at the stage in my career that I want a lot more of them so I can look back and say, hey, you did okay even a few more times. And so that's basically it, it with me. To the left of the aisle toward the back. Coach Jim Roof, Westwood One News. Number one seed facing a number 10 seed. What kind of pressure is there for you to win this game or at this level, does the rankings not even matter? Personally, I think the rankings do not matter at all because if you tell me that we're one and they're 10 and that means that they give, give us some points, I'd be really happy. But you'd probably say that we got to give them like it's golf, trying to even it up. You know, there's a golf course in the mountains of North Carolina that has concrete blocks that says spot died here because, you know, guys always want you to spot them some shots. Well, spot died here too. There's no points, no strokes or anything in the NCAA tournament. And for me, Jimmy Beheim's Syracuse team is really good and deserves to be here because they beat teams to get here. They didn't vote Syracuse to get here. They beat teams to get here. Everybody that they were lined up to play, they beat them to get here. And the fact that uh, they're playing pretty doggone well too. What they did to Virginia, I didn't think I would ever see because I've got such great respect for Tony Bennett and his club. and. Man, that was a, what the second half. That was so impressive. Probably as impressive a basketball time period I've seen all year. To the right. If you guys don't play golf, I'm sorry about all my golf analogies. Roy Brian Hamilton from Sports Illustrated. Obviously, you guys don't need Marcus this year in the way you needed him when he was a sophomore. Um, but what's what's the difference for a guy when he goes from being the guy to not necessarily always have to? guys how much of an adjustment is that well I think it's a little adjustment you know and Tyler Hansbro for us carried us for a couple of years and we went a national championship and he had a lot of help you know because we had Ty and Danny and and uh, Wayne Ellington and Dion uh, but uh, I think two things one thing it runs from both those kids they want to win Marcus was phenomenal as a sophomore phenomenal as good a year as I've ever had a backcourt player play and if you go in that locker room and ask Marcus if he enjoyed his sophomore year more or his senior year more, he's going to tell you he enjoyed this year more because he and Tyler Hansworth both cared about winning. Uh, there is a big difference. I mean, if Marcus didn't play well, we didn't win. Early in Tyler's career, if he didn't get 25 and 12, we didn't win. But I think both those kids appreciate winning and understand how difficult it is, and they enjoy that more. Up in the front, but to the right of the aisle, Mike. Michael Preston, com. How hard, Roy, is it to simulate Syracuse zone in yeah. practice, and what, what can you do to, to do it? Michael, it, as you know, it's impossible to simulate. It, you just can't do it. First of all, our uh, blue team's not 
six five six six across the front line and got Roberson back there and, and Juan Coleman back there and Malachi and all those guys. Uh, but we don't know all the little things that uh, makes it so successful because Jimmy's the one that knows that and, and he's the guy that coaches it. We watch it on tape, we show them on tape, we show them plays of when we have played them, uh, but it is really hard to simulate that in practice. And, you know, you got those guys in football that try to simulate the triple option. If you don't have one of those great quarterbacks, it, it, it doesn't work. And for us, you just got to keep trying and do everything you can. Toward the back in the middle. Uh, Brooke Pryor, North State Journal. Roy, you've become close friends with your old coaches and own players when they were done playing or you were done playing. Is Marcus one of those guys that you envision having a long-lasting relationship with? Yes, and gosh, I hope so. And I think it will because he's one of the most incredible young men I've ever been around. Marcus Page has made me a better coach every day. Uh, he, he teaches me something every day. I think you have an opportunity to learn from every player, uh, but Marcus truly has the gift of getting other people uh, to follow him. And uh, he has that gift, and I hope that uh, our relationship only gets better and better, and, and I think it will. Staying in the center toward the back, Zach. Uh, yep. Zach Brazil, New York Post. Coach, what's been so different about Joel Berry last year to this year, and how is he different? Zach, I think the biggest thing is he's helped, been healthy this year. You know, last year he was growing poor, had a concussion at one time, I think. Uh, he banged heads with somebody. I can't remember now who it was. But he was basically hurt all year and trying to get more playing time and not being as successful and, you know, just snowball kind of effect of things going wrong. He even missed a game because he got sick. I mean, he's back in his dorm room and roommates walk in. He said, how'd you guys do? You know, I said, what do you mean, how'd you guys do? You're part of it. How'd we do? But, I mean, he's asleep and as sick as a dog and can't even watch the game. So I think the health has been the big issue. And then the other thing is sweat. I think he saw some of the things that he needed to do and needed to improve, and he worked his little rear end off on it. We got three right in the same general area. Let's okay. start in the back. Okay. Powell Latimer from the Greensboro News and Record. Roy, Theo's been an emotional guy for you in March, but he's also played really well. What's been the key to his improvement on the court, not mm -hmm. just him kind of taking over press conferences? <laughs> uh, you know, every year I get together with guys at the end of the season and talk about the three biggest things that you've got to do. Uh, and one of those with Theo is you've got to value the basketball more, you know, not turn it over. And his assist to error ratio this year, knock on wood, if he messes up tomorrow night, I'm going to blame you, or Saturday. Uh, has been off the charts. He's given us another playmaker out there, not at a point guard position. So that's the number one thing. He's given us a burst of energy sometimes. Last year in the Notre Dame game, he gave us a tremendous burst in the Notre Dame game. And then, you know, he was hurt and tried to play and just wasn't healthy. So a little bit like Joel Berry, he's so much healthier this year that he's able to give us more things. And eventually, Theo is going to 100% buy into about how good he can be defensively and use that concentration there. And he's going to be a fantastic player eventually defensively. And eventually, he's going to uh, be a much better shooter because he's going to work at it. Stay in that same area, Pete. Uh, Roy, Pete Thamel from Sports Illustrated. Uh, Two-part question here. The first is uh, I saw your comments on, on the radio yesterday where you took umbrage with the story in the Washington Post that I felt like painted your health as failing and maybe a little bit frail. First part is what is the reality of your health right now, Roy? And the second part is will the results of this weekend factor into any potential retirement? Okay, I appreciate You know, I, I was very disappointed in the article. I've got two of my very good friends that came to me almost – literally apologizing, just tears in her eyes because they felt like that they were misquoted. I have never read the article, never will read the article. Those kind of things do bother me. I have thin skin, but especially thin skin when it hurts people that I truly, truly care about. And their reaction to me really bothered me. Uh, the fact is of my health, I'm pretty doggone good. You know, uh, uh, up until the knee surgeries this summer, I was working out eight times a week, which more than most people do. I felt like I could play 45 holes of golf in every day, 27 days in a row, and never get tired. 
I still feel that way as long as I've got a cart right now that can drive right up to the ball. Uh, so uh, my health, I've got a head cold right now, I've got a sinus infection, I've got two bum knees, and I've never felt better in my life than I feel right now. And uh, so that, I do take uh, offense at that kind of article that takes something that somebody says it's not truly what they said, but also it portrays, uh, my guys think I'm wacko. You know, I don't think guys think your coach is wacko and you do weird things if they think you're on your deathbed. Uh, the other thing is this, uh, what happens the next uh, five days is going to have nothing to do with what I do the rest of my life. If this was the first time and the only time that I would ever make a Final Four and the only time that I was ever going to have a chance to win a national championship, you know, it might have a difference. But, you know, I've been very fortunate to coach a few more and I hope to coach some more. But when I quit, uh, it will not be because of anything that happens this weekend. Same area. Uh, Roy, uh, Chris Carlson from Syracuse Media Group. Uh, the investigation's obviously gone on up there a while, like it did for Syracuse. Um, yet you guys are here. Uh, how much tangible impact do you think it's had so far? I think it, uh, Jimmy and I had to answer the same question this morning together, and hopefully we won't have to answer it continually while we're here. But uh, I think it affected us uh, because it was our school. Jimmy went to Syracuse. I went to North Carolina. We've always loved those places, perhaps more than it would have any other coach. It had nothing to do with these players. These players were not involved. It affected us as a distraction, the way people looked at us personally. Uh, but again, our teams are here because they played their way here. They had nothing to do with all the stuff. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to talking about zone defenses and fast breaks and basketball players who have accomplished a great deal. All the way in the back and all the way on the left, Coach. I'll, I'll relieve you a bit and talk about the zone defense, Coach. Wolf Thank Logic, you. Yahoo Sports Radio. Uh, the adjustments in the second half that, that uh, Syracuse made very, very much talked about. How do you go about practicing not only what they did in that second half with the pressure and with the full court versus what they do with their base defense? I, must, I missed your first name, and I apologize. Will. 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 Will, I'm assuming you're talking about in the second half of the Virginia game and not the second half of the season, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, it didn't surprise me because I've played Jimmy many times in the past, and some of his teams in the past have been known as great pressing teams. Every time we've played Syracuse in my entire career, we've always worked on press offense because he still has that in his brain and in his basketball notebook. Uh, I think <coughs> – they did it so well, Virginia had to help them a little bit, and I think that was the surprise because, again, the, the respect and the, the value that I had placed on Virginia, and it was one of those terrible times, but, you know, you can't let that color what happened to Virginia for the last three years because they've been sensational. But on game day in the second half, they made mistakes they don't normally make, and it's a little bit of both. Jimmy's club really did a great job, and Virginia helped them. But that's what happens anytime you press, because when you press, you open up the court and you create opportunities for your team and openings for other team as well. But uh, uh, we've worked on press offense for two days. We'll work on it again tomorrow. And we have things that we've always tried to do against press. Uh, we feel that they'll try to press us. We felt that they would try to press us in Syracuse. We felt like they would try to press us in uh, Chapel Hill. And only one guy decides, and that's Jimmy Boeheim. But, uh, you go back in his career, they've had some teams that were really good pressing teams. We have another question in the center. To drag you away from basketball again for a second, last year with the controversy over the Indiana law, the NABC and the four, final four coaches released a statement supporting the NCAA's position, um, and that obviously got sorted out right before the final four. Um, in North Carolina with HB2, the NCAA has taken a similar position. Um, are you concerned that you know the state, which has hosted so many NCAA events, might lose that opportunity? You know, Luke, it's a tough, difficult question you're asking of someone who doesn't know completely as much as I'd like to know before I make statements about a law. I hope that it doesn't put our state in a bad light in any direction. Roy Williams, University of North Carolina, University of North Carolina basketball has always been about diversity. Uh, my mentor. Uh, was a big about diversity and including everyone. And that's something that I've uh, very much appreciated since I was a kid. 
uh, who I played with was extremely important to me, and I didn't isolate anyone. I think the University of North Carolina and Roy Williams and our basketball program is about diversity and always will be, and I hope that we will always include everybody involved, and that's really all that I can say because I don't know enough about it and may have even said more than I should have said, depending on what I know. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we have for this afternoon. Thank you very much, Coach. We'll see thank you tomorrow. You. Mark, thank you.